Very, very, very good. Well, for those of you who don't know, like I said, we are having a lot of fun in this series called Don't Laugh, because as we walk through this, we're asking a question, and the question is this, can you enjoy God? Is it possible to enjoy life with God? And typically, we understand that we can pray to God, and we can bring God questions, and we can wrestle through things with God, but can you can you laugh with God? Is it possible to actually enjoy God. And when you look at something like, like what we just walked through, does God enjoy that the way that, the way that we enjoy it? And we've been looking at this passage that we find in John chapter 15, where Jesus says to his followers, listen to what he says. I want to take us back to it. He says, I've loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things, And he's talking about all that he's taught them, everything that he's walked them through. He says, I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. The joy that I have, that it will fill you. Not just that you'll be filled with it. It says, yes, your joy will overflow. That it's going to flow out of you. And as we talked about last week, this isn't just a, a, some peace that you experience. This is, this is an active, there's, there's, there's an idea of rejoicing in this. And he says, I want, for you, I want for you to experience my joy, for you to be full of that joy. And last week I asked you, do you want this? And I think for, for many of us, as we came out of last week, we thought, man, I, I, I would kind of want that. But for most of us, we still don't think it's possible. We still don't think it's possible. But I, but I invited you last week, I invited you last week just to open the door, just to open the door to the reality that maybe, just maybe, Jesus isn't lying. Maybe, just maybe, it's actually possible for us to experience his joy. But no matter whether you thought it was possible or not, for most of us, we walked out of last week and we said, but how? Well, then how do I know that? How in the world do I find that? How in the world do I experience that? And experience is actually the right word. This isn't the only place in the scriptures where it talks about us knowing and experiencing that joy. There's actually a really interesting conversation that Paul has with the church as he's coming to the end of his life. And he's trying to figure out, okay, is this the end? Is this not the end? What's God going to do? Is God going to give me more time? Uh, let, Let me take you to this passage. It's found in Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, he's writing to the church, and he's wrestling through, is this the end? Is this not the end? And he, and he comes to the conclusion, he says, no, 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 I think that God's going to give me more time to continue to impact people, to continue my ministry, and listen to the reason why he gives. He says, knowing this, I'm convinced that I will remain alive so I can continue to help all of you grow and experience what? The joy of your faith. He's identifying, no, there's something that's still lacking in you. He says, there's something I still need to work on in you. He says, I want for you. He says, it's available to you, but you're not experiencing it. He says, I want for you to be able to experience the joy of your faith. In this passage, he says, it's literally worth me staying alive for. I think that it's worth God continuing my ministry. Why? So that you can experience what I've experienced. And when you read through, when you read through the New Testament, which is the books in the scripture, the letters in the scripture that are written after Jesus, when you read through those letters, you see that those who knew Jesus, those who knew Jesus understood what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 15. They experienced that joy. They knew that joy. This is what allowed them, and this wasn't just a passive peace in their life. This is what allowed them to be thrown into prison and to sing, to get beaten and to walk out celebrating. They experienced a joy in their faith that they recognized that the church wasn't experiencing. So they're constantly writing to the church saying, no, 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 you need to choose joy. You need to experience this joy. You need to know this joy. Why? Because they knew it. Just like Jesus knew it, they knew it. And they wanted, just as Paul is saying to the Corinthians, no, 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 I want for you to understand. And not just to understand it, not, not, not just have it be available to you. I want for you to experience that joy. The way that I've experienced that joy. 
I want for you to know this. So then how? How in the world, how in the world do we do that? And over the next couple of weeks, I want, I want to walk through with you really what God's been walking through with me over the course of the last, I'd say probably six months or so, where, where he, is, he is changing me in ways that I, I've never experienced before. He's working my heart in ways I've never experienced before. And, he, and he's, he's helped me to be able to see something that I've, I've struggled with for a very, very, very long time as it pertains to this idea of joy. And I think there are three foundational things. There are three things that, that God teaches us more than anything else that are crucial to us knowing and experiencing. Knowing is the wrong thing. For us experiencing that joy. Now, now what we're going to talk to you today and what we're going to look at that God's calling us to step into is it's built on a foundation. And that foundation is this. You have to understand this. This is actually very important for you to understand who God is, how God works, what God's teaching you as you read through those letters that he's written to the church throughout the New Testament. And that is this. God, God thinks that you can control you. The, the, the foundation of everything that we're going to walk through, you have to understand, is that God, God calls us to be in control of us. He, he calls us to, to be in control of our lives, of our emotions. Not the circumstances, but he calls us to be in control of us. There's an interesting passage in Corinthians, and, and in the passage, the context of it is that Paul's writing to them, and he's talking about how they operate inside their services. But he says something really, really powerful. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 14. It says, Remember that people who prophesy are in control of their spirit and can take turns, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, and in all the meetings of God's, as in all the meetings of God's holy people. And in the middle of this, this passage, he teaches them something really, really powerful. Another translation says it this way. It says, The prophet is subject to the prophet. In, in other words, in other words, you are not subject to what it is that you're feeling in the moment. You are in control of you. He's saying the prophet is in control of themselves. They have the ability to control when they speak and when they don't speak. He says, you need to be in control of you. He says, God doesn't lead you to a life where you're not in control of you. As a matter of fact, one of the fruits of the Spirit is what? Self-control. We don't talk about this very often. We talk about love and joy and peace. We don't even talk about patience and goodness. But one of the fruits of God's spirit in your life is self-control. You are in control of you. God says, you can know someone who's been with me. You can know someone who has my spirit. How will I know them? They're in control of themselves. They have self-control. You have to understand that as God steps into our lives, he calls us to be in control of us. Not that we control the circumstances, but that we have self-control. And then in that, one of, the, one of the ways that we exercise that is that we control what it is that our joy is attached to. God says, the, the fruit of my spirit is self-control. You need to be in control of you, including, including what it is that your joy is attached to. Now, we live in a culture, we live in a culture that says that you can't control your feelings. We live in a culture that says, no, 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 you need to be true to your feelings, not control your feelings. You need to be true to your feelings, not, uh, not change your feelings. And the more that you're true to your feelings, the better off your life is going to be. It is the, one of the greatest lies of our culture, that you need to be true to your feelings. That's not what God teaches. God doesn't teach you to be true to your feelings. God teaches you to connect your feelings to truth. Listen, because if you get nothing else out of this, you have to get this. God doesn't teach you to be true to your feelings. He teaches you to connect your feelings to truth. If you live your life being true to your feelings, you're going to be miserable. 
You're going to be miserable because your feelings are fleeting. And you're going to move in this direction, in that direction, in this direction, in that direction, and they are going to let you down. Over and over again, your life is going to look like a pinball. For some of you, your, your life looks like a pinball machine because of the fact that you are true to your feelings. And so you're bouncing off of this and that and this and that and this and that and this direction, this direction. This, and it is going to destroy you because being true to your feelings, when you're true to your feelings, your feelings are going to tell you, no, 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 that affair is worth it. And it's not. Your feelings are going to tell you that this is love and it's not. And God says, no, 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 you need to be in control of you. And you need to be in control of what it is that your joy is attached to. The writers of the New Testament are walking through this with us over and over and over again. Sometimes they're walking through it from the perspective of, of our joy being attached to the wrong things. So one of the things that it teaches us over and over again, that, that those who knew Jesus, those that experienced his joy, one of the things that they're telling us over and over again is don't attach your joy to money. Don't attach your joy to money. First Timothy, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all that we need for our enjoyment. He says, don't attach your joy to your money because your money is fleeting. You can't control that. Don't attach your joy to it. James chapter 1, dear brothers and sisters, when trouble comes your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. He says, don't attach your joy to your circumstances. Don't attach your joy. And, and throughout, as those who experience God's joy, one of the things that they're, one of the ways that they approach this is that they step into our lives and say, don't attach your joy to these things. Don't attach your joy to this. Don't attach your joy to what people think about you. Don't attach your joy to what people say about you. Don't attach, attach your joy to your success. Don't, and they walk us through the don'ts as far as what we need to make sure that our joy isn't attached to. But then also at the same time, he's stepping in our lives and saying, now what I want you to do is I want you to attach your joy to other things. So it's not that you just detach your joy from these things, but you need to attach them to something else. And so consistently, consistently they're coming to us and saying, listen, you want to know the joy that Jesus is talking about? You want to know the joy that you've seen us experience, how we've experienced his joy? Then you have to take control of you and you have to change what your joy is attached to. Detach it from these things and attach it over here. Now, these are the things. There's five things specifically in Scripture that we are called to attach our joy to. The first one, and this is a passage that we looked at last week, is our salvation. Because I want you to connect your joy. I want, to con I want you to look for joy and to experience joy, to attach your joy to your salvation. So Romans 4, David also spoke about this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. He says, I want you to attach your joy to the reality that you were declared righteous before God without working for it. That it had nothing to do with you, that you didn't have anything to work for or to accomplish in order for that to happen. I want you to attach your joy to that. I want you to experience the joy of that. I want you to celebrate that. I want you to find enjoyment in that. Because I want you to attach it to your salvation. Beyond that, he calls us, and they call us to attach our joy to God's presence. Acts 2.28, you have shown me the way of life, and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. That there's a joy that comes from God's presence in my life. And to experience that joy, and to engage that joy, and to celebrate that joy. This is exactly what it's talking about with the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit in your life is not something that God gives you. It's the natural result of God's presence in your life. And so he's saying that presence of God in your life, it, it results in joy. Not only are we called to attach our joy to our salvation and to his presence, but over and over again we're called to attach our joy to our eternity. Luke chapter 6, what blessings await you when people hate you and exclude you and mock you and curse you as evil because you follow the Son of Man. When that happens, be happy. Now listen, listen, because again, some of you, you're not excited about this idea of joy because you've been told, you've been told that this is just inner peace. 
And so you're like, joy isn't that you're happy or that you're excited about anything. Joy, joy, and it's almost this neutral thing, that joy is that you're not upset or that you're not depressed or you're not, uh, but that's not what he says here. He says, no, 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 when this happens, be happy. Yes, leap for joy. Leap for joy. He's not talking about something that's just internal. This is obviously external. He says, leap for joy. For a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, their ancestors treated the ancient prophets the same way. And in this passage, what is he saying? He's saying, detach your joy from this and attach it to this. Detach it from what people think about you or what people say about you and attach it to your eternity. He's talking about actively controlling what our joy is attached to. Hebrews chapter 10. Think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful, even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and were beaten, and sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail, and when all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. Why? Because you knew there were better things awaiting for you that will last forever, because their joy was attached to something else. First Peter, dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it's revealed to the world. He says you need to attach your joy to your eternity. You need to attach your joy to what's coming. You need to attach your joy to what God has told you about how what you're, in, what you're experiencing now is going to impact what you experience there. You have to attach your joy to something else. And, and sometimes we read through these passages. Sometimes we read through these passages and we think to ourselves, well, I'm not being beaten. This doesn't really apply to me. Right? I'm, I'm, not, going, I'm not going through something that painful. This, isn't really, this doesn't really apply to me. But, but you, have to look at, you have to look beyond that. It's not just about the circumstances. It's about, okay, do you care about how people treat you or do you care about what's happening in eternity? Do you care about whether or not you're being recognized and rewarded or do you care about what's happening in eternity? This, this has direct implications on your job on, to, for your job on Monday morning. And no, you're not being beaten, but you may be in a situation where you're doing what's right and because of that, you're not being rewarded. Or you realize that, no, you know, if I do what's right, I'm not going to get promoted. He says, no, 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 you attach your joy to your eternity. You have to change what your joy is attached to. Your, your salvation, God's presence, your eternity. Number four, it teaches us to attach our joy to the mission. John chapter four, the harvesters are paid good wages and the fruit... They harvest as people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. So you need to attach your joy to Christ's mission in the world. First Thessalonians, dear brothers and sisters, after we were separated from you for a little while, though our hearts never left you, we tried very hard to come back because of our intense longing to see you again. We wanted very much to come to you, and I, Paul, tried again and again, but Satan prevented us. After all, what gives us hope and joy and what will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before the Lord Jesus when he returns? It is you. Yes, you are our pride and joy. He's talking about the fact that they have attached their joy to the mission and, and, and how God is impacting the world around them. You attach your joy to that mission. And throughout, throughout the New Testament, those who have experienced God's joy are saying, no, 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 take control of this in your life. Take control of this in your life. You are not a victim to this. Take control of this and attach your joy to something bigger. The last thing is found in James chapter 1. This verse that we looked at just a moment ago, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, when trouble come your, comes your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Why? Because my joy isn't attached to things going right. My joy is attached to what? For when, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. I attach my joy to my character. It says you need to attach your joy to your character. 
And in those situations, I realize I can experience joy. Why? Because it's not attached to how people are treating me or what people are saying about me. It's attached to the development of my character. And they're stepping in and saying, take control. Take control. Take control of what it is that your joy is attached to and attach it to something bigger. Now, how do you do that? I was, I was wrestling through this, wrestling through this with God, saying, okay, I understand. I understand that our joy needs to be connected to the things that you're calling us to connect it to. And, and I want to I value you, and I want to value the things that you value. But how do I change what I value? Now, now, you should pay very close attention to this because this is a question you ask all the time. You don't ask it that way, but you're constantly working through this in your life where you value something you know you shouldn't value and you want to value something else, but you don't know how to change it. You ask yourself this question on a weekly basis. And Jesus has actually taught us the answer. And it's not just in telling ourselves over and over again the answer. Because some of you right now are skeptical because I've told you that you need to attach your joy to this, but you know that's not going to solve the problem. Because you already knew that. Intellectually, you already understood that. So how do I, how do I align what I feel, how do I attach my joy, how do I align what I feel to what I know, to what I know I should value? This is a principle. This is a principle that Jesus has taught us. And it's something that we understand. We just, we don't apply it to all of our life the way that we should. You see, Jesus says, Jesus says, if you want to control if you want to control where your heart goes, you control where your investment goes. Now, in the passage that he teaches us this, he's specifically talking about money. But he's saying, he's trying to help us understand a principle. It's true about every single one of us. What you invest in is what you care about. What you invest in is what you care about. Now, we, we understand this, but we rarely ever live by this principle. We understand. You can underst- I, I, can, I can figure out what's important to you by watching you for a week. And I'll watch where you spend your time, and I'll watch what it is that you give your talents to, and I'll watch what it is that you give your treasures to, and I'll know what's important to you. And Jesus says, if, if you want to control, if you want to control what you value, control where you invest. Control where you invest. And the more that you pour your life, your time, the more that you pour your treasures, the best of what you have, the more that you pour your talents, into something, the more that you will value it. It's just true. You can't even stop it. This is one of the, this is one of the genius things that companies have done for the past couple decades because they realized a little while back, if we give our employees an investment in the company, they'll value it even if they don't like working here. Some of you work at the companies that you work at. You don't enjoy working there, but you're so invested in it. You can't walk away. Because what you're invested in, you value. Some of, some of you, there are companies that you look at their stock price every day. You don't even know what they do. You don't know what they make. All you know is you're invested in it. And so you care. Otherwise, you'd never think for a moment about them.
If you want to control what you value, take control of what you invest in. And so Jesus says, I want you to invest your life into these different things. He says, I want, you to, I, w- I want for you to spend time remembering and reflecting on the salvation that I've made possible for you. This is why we do communion. It's investing time in remembering the salvation that God has made possible for us. I want you to invest your time into learning more about that and experiencing the fullness of that. I want you to invest in that. And the more that you invest in that, the more that you will value it, the more that your joy will be connected to it. I want you to invest in spending time in my presence. Right now, there's a class that's taking place on the third floor called Rhythms. It's a chance for you to invest in experiencing the presence of God And some of you have known that that's available for for you for months and months and months, but you're not going to take advantage of it. Why? Because you're not really interested in investing in that. How much time, how much time have you spent over the last year investing in, investing in experiencing God's presence? Now, for some of you, it's a lot because you're here every week. Why? Because you want to invest in that. You want to invest in experiencing God's presence. And the more that you invest in it, what have you found? The more that you value it, the more joy you find in it. The same thing with your eternity. He said, I want you to invest in your eternity. I want you, I want you to invest in the mission. The people who experience the greatest joy at baptisms are those who've invested the most in the mission. Because what you invest in is what you value. It's what you find your joy in. How much time this past year have you spent investing in your character? As I was working through this, it challenged me because there are people in my life who really care about my character. And far too often, far too often, they get pushed aside by what I think is most important in that moment or what I have to do next or what. And it shows that I don't really value it. I'm not investing in it. So I shouldn't be surprised that my joy isn't found in it. You, you are in control of you. You are not a victim of you. You are in control of you. And you can control what it is that your joy is attached to. When the scriptures come to you and say, choose joy, it's not talking about a moment. It's talking about a lifestyle. It's talking about the way that we look at the world and what it is on a day-to-day basis that we decide that we're going to attach our joy to. And God comes in and says, you can change this in your life. And I want to walk you through changing this. Because I want for you to know that joy. I want for you to know that joy. And God doesn't, God doesn't step into our lives and say, and this is, this is so important, God doesn't step into your life and say your pain doesn't matter. L- listen very carefully to me. God does not step into your life and say your pain doesn't matter. God doesn't step into your life and say you shouldn't experience pain. As a matter of fact, Jesus clearly teaches that we should mourn, that we should mourn with one another. And in one of Jesus' most famous talks, he talks through the fact, he says specifically, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. It's something that we understand. That, listen, in order for you to experience comfort, you have to work through the mourning process. You have to go through that process. It's necessary. Jesus doesn't step into your life. And I want to make sure that this is clear as we walk through this, because some of you might walk out and say, oh, oh, Chris is saying that we need to get rid of pain and experience joy. No, 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 no. God doesn't step into your life and say that the pain doesn't matter or that the pain is going to decrease. That's not what he says. God steps into your life and says, listen, you can experience two things at the same time. As a matter of fact, Paul specifically says that when he talks about his journey and when he talks about what he's experiencing. Listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians. It says, our hearts ache, but we always have joy. He's experiencing two things at the same time. God says, listen, you can experience pain, but at the same time, you can experience my joy. 
You can experience both of them at the same time. And so you can walk through those things that are really, really difficult, but still be able to enjoy the good that I've brought into your life. This is so important. You, you, you have to grab a hold of this because this is, going to be, this is going to be a struggle for you when life knocks down your door. If it's not a struggle for you right now, it's going to be a struggle for you when life knocks down your door. And when pain comes into our life in that way, it consumes everything. And we sometimes think, we sometimes think that we should only experience pain. Sometimes we think that we're betraying whatever the loss was if we don't only experience pain. But God says, no, 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 no. You can experience pain and my joy at the same time. You can walk through mourning and at the same time be able to experience the joy of your salvation and at the same time still be able to enjoy your spouse when 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 we buy into the idea that we can only experience one thing we buy into the idea that we're we're betraying the loss we're betraying it destroys the relationships in our lives i've seen it happen so many times where someone experiences that pain and they think i can only experience that pain and it begins to consume everything we lose our ability to enjoy the relationships that we have we lose our ability to enjoy our kids we lose our ability and it causes all of this unnecessary destruction in our lives and God said, no, 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 I'm giving you permission to experience both at the same time. And I'm not telling you that your pain is small. I'm not telling you to decrease your pain or that it doesn't matter. I'm just telling you that there's a joy that's bigger. Over the past couple months, as I read through those reviews that you guys heard me talk about on Christmas Eve, where people were making up fake accounts to write all sorts of things about me and... and and lie about me. As I read those things, it hurt. The pain was real. And God doesn't step into that moment and say, the pain doesn't matter. All he's saying is, the hurt of that is nothing compared to the joy of the fact that I've been declared righteous without ever working for it. And that before God, no one can ever take that from me. And so even though the pain is there, I can still experience that joy and I can still enjoy the good in my life and all that God's brought into my life that's good and the blessings of God in my life. He's not saying it doesn't matter. He's just saying that the joy is bigger. That the joy is bigger. He says, you got to take, you have to take control in your life. You have to take control of what it is that your joy is attached to. It was interesting for me as I walked through this because I realized in walking through this that I'd seen someone live this out my entire life. You see, my mom has lived her entire life with unbelievable pain. She has extremely intense arthritis. She's in her 50s. She's already had, I think, four or five joints that have been replaced because of the fact that there's literally no cartilage left in her body. Every time she moves, the bones just scrape against bones. There's not an, an ounce of cartilage left in her body besides maybe her nose or ears. It's all out of her joints. And I watch her every day wake up in physical pain. Excruciating physical pain. And she had a choice. She had a choice. What was her joy going to be attached to? And if her joy was attached to her circumstance, if her joy was attached to the dreams that she had of what her life was going to look like, she would have lived her life completely miserable. But she decided to attach her joy to something else. And I watched my mom live her life 
Not a moment of her life that I ever saw was without pain. But I watched her experience incredible joy. Because she decided to take control of what her joy would be attached to. I walked out of this past month and I was talking to my friend the other day. And I said, you know, looking back on what's happened over the past couple of months, I said, I've almost come to the point where I value it. I said, it almost seems weird to me, but I almost come to the point where I value it. And he looked at me like, what in the world? How in the world can that happen? How, how in the world do you get to the point where you value something like that? And I realized, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I, I want for him to develop that in me. I, I want to be able to experience the joy uh, of people being able to say whatever they want about me, but, but, but me being able to experience that joy because I'm invested in and because I value and my joy is attached to my eternity and what he's going to say about me when I stand in front of him. And for me to be able to have the character to walk through those things and not become bitter, but to be joyful. I want that. And God stepped into our lives and said, there's a joy that's bigger, but you got to change what it is that you're connected to and what your joy's attached to. And in the midst of that pain, the pain's going to be real and God experiences it with you and he walks through it with you, but the joy is bigger. But there's one other thing that you have to know. And that is this. For some of you, Jesus is an add-on to your life. You're on this journey with us and you love Hoboken Grace and you love the things that you learn here. But Jesus is an add-on to your life. You like him because he makes your life a little bit better and the principles that he teaches you help you to live your life a little bit better. What we're talking about in this conversation isn't available if that's how you live your life. The joy of God is found in an all-in life. It's an all-in thing. The promises of God are not found in an add-on life. It's an all-in deal. That's when you come to the point where you say, Jesus isn't part of my life. Jesus is my life. Jesus isn't a nice thing in my life. Jesus consumes my life. Jesus is all I have in life. See, when you go all in, your salvation is everything. When you go all in, his presence is what you crave more than anything else. When you go all in, you're passionate about the mission. His mission, accomplishing his mission, doing whatever you can to be able to see people come to know him. You're passionate about your character. Why? Because I want to be like him. It's an all in thing. And I know that it terrifies you. I know it does. I know it does. Because you want to hold on to those things. The things of this world. The title. All those things where we want to find our jo joy. But it's not found there. And he gave his life to show you that you can trust him. But it's an all-in thing. The joy of God 
is not an illusion. It's not just something that we read about. It's real. It's real. And you can know it. But you have to take control of you and change what it is that your joy is attached to and decide, you know what? I'm all in. Will you pray with me? Father, as we walk through this, I want to pray for those who are here who are in pain. Father, I pray that as we as we talk about this, that they would understand that you're not saying that their pain isn't real. You're not calling them to ignore it. You're not calling them to diminish it. But that you're calling them to the reality that there's a joy, that they can know and experience a joy that's bigger, a joy that will allow them to be able to, in the midst of that pain, to be able to experience the goodness that you've brought into their life, to be able to experience this journey with you, to be able to experience what it's like to mourn with you. Father, I, I, I pray. I pray that they would know that. And then, Father, I pray that, that we would follow you in this, that we would decide, that we would decide that we are no longer going to be content with our joy being attached to things that are meaningless and trivial and but for a moment, but that we would decide, no, 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 no. Our joy is attached to what's going to last. And our joy is attached to what matters. And our joy is attached to what has happened to us and for us. And our joy is attached to the fact that every day, in everything that happens in every circumstance you are working for us to become like your son and our joy is attached to that which will never ever be taken from us father i pray i pray that you would begin to well up within us first and foremost a craving for that that we would begin to crave that more than the meaningless things that, 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 this, that this world and that our joy is so often attached to and we would become obsessed that we would become obsessed with the things that you are obsessed with, that we would begin to run after and pursue and crave those things where joy is actually found. Father, I pray. I pray. God, we pray. We, we beg of you. We beg of you to rip out of us those false things that our joy is attached to, that we might know your joy that it might overflow in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and sing with us?